right here on the AM show, we're continuing our conversation or we're starting another conversation it has to do with uh, my interview with Harriet Thompson, the first female high com UK High Commissioner to Ghana. She's been speaking about a number of things and uh, we're going to have that conversation with her in a bit. So do stay tuned in. This is still the AM show. Hello. Hi. Nice to see you. Nice to see you. Thank you. And uh, thank you too. So, well, this is where we take off our masks. Super. So, yeah, it's, um, we're in a pandemic and so we have to keep our mask on all the time. But yes, for an interview like this where we're outdoors and there's a lot of breeze and we're socially distanced, it's okay to take off the mask. So, yes, we can get into the conversation straight away. You're welcome. Thank you. Um, Your Excellency Harriet Thompson, the British High Commissioner to Ghana. But you're not just Ghana, it's, it's Ghana in a number of uh, other West African countries, That's right? right, yeah. I'll be non-resident ambassador also to Togo, Benin and Burkina Faso. All right, so you have been uh, in Ghana for a few months now. What's, what's it been like? Oh, your first such friends. a warm welcome. Okay. It's been lovely, really lovely. Uh, my family are here with me now. They're also feeling very happily settled. It's been great getting to know a few people. All of the conversations that I've had give me absolute confidence that we're going to have a great time here as a family, but also that there's loads of good stuff that the UK and Ghana can continue doing together. Well, yeah, and uh, maybe on behalf of uh, Ghanaians, I'd want to welcome you, you. To, to Ghana and uh, say Akwaba. Medasi. <laughs> okay, so you've picked up some... Uh, not enough, not you know, enough. Well, yeah, but you, you get it. I you, will. You, you get it. And I, I like your pants. You've Thank already you. assimilated. Yeah, I in, love in, African into... fabrics. It's a bit of a weakness, I'm afraid. Ah. <laughs> All right, so... Um, I'm happy you're enjoying your, your stay so far. You were previously posted to uh, Nigeria where you were Deputy High Commissioner in Abuja and then Lagos. I want to understand how the system works in Nigeria because here in Ghana we just have the Accra, mm -hmm. uh, the High Commission based in Accra, but in Nigeria you have two. Yeah, that's right. Because Nigeria is such a big country, right. we have what's called our sovereign post, our main post in the capital, Abuja, but we also, we also have some subordinate missions. So the Deputy High Commission in Lagos is the biggest of those, but we have another four offices across the country as well. So I was the Deputy High Commissioner and Deputy Head of Mission in Abuja and then moved down to Lagos and was the head of that subordinate post. Okay, so you've been in Ghana for a few months. Have you tried any of your foods yet? I have, I have. Kelewele is my all-time favorite okay. so far. Kele delicious. Wele. Okay. Delicious. But it's quite spicy. Yeah, that's good though. That's good. Oh, it's, yeah. you, you're okay with the spice? Not too much spice, but yeah, spicy is nice. Okay, yeah. I, I wouldn't get into um, the conversations about jollof, but I don't mind if you want to talk about jollof. And, delicious. Uh, maybe talk about All versions are delicious. <laughs> Apart from my own, I should say. Uh, in between the time in Nigeria and in Ghana, uh, we were back in the UK for about a year, and I tried to cook jollof rice okay. on a few occasions for my kids. And each time I tried a different recipe, and each time they said no. So it turns out that all jollof is good apart from my jollof. <laughs> okay, you're trying to be diplomatic here. Is that what you're trying to do so yeah. that you don't There's no way. Into There's the... no way I'm coming out on the question that you want me to come out on, no. <laughs> you don't want to talk about diplomatic the incidents. jollof wars? No way, no way. Oh. All varieties are good apart from my own. Okay, that's a, smart, that's a smart way to go about it. But yeah, I'm sure there are people who will be wondering, okay, she's been in Ghana, she has to be, you know, tell us that our jollof is nice. We like to be told that our jollof is nice. It's very nice. It's very nice. I enjoy it very much, yeah. But you're not going to get into the war. No way. Between no way. Nigeria. I'm a diplomat. How, how about uh, Nigeria jollof? Very nice too. <laughs> I can get you. I can get you. Anyway, what, um, have you always been... A, a diplomat or you got into it at some point in your career? No, I wasn't always a diplomat. Um, when I left university, 
I decided not to join the diplomatic service because I didn't like the idea of moving on. I'm very bad at saying goodbyes. So I joined uh, as a regular civil servant. Okay. I've worked in six different government departments covering a huge range of areas, trade policy, organised crime, climate, energy, a real range. Um, I've worked for the Foreign Office previously, a long time ago at our permanent representation to the EU where I worked on trade policy. Uh, and then the next posting was in Nigeria. The range of experience that I've had across the UK civil service is really good for a posting like this because the breadth of our relationship with Ghana is so wide. Um, having done a little bit of a lot of things puts me in quite a, a good position. Okay, so, but what did you want to be growing up? Uh, the one thing I knew growing up is that I wanted to travel, I wanted to see the world. So I had various things on my list that I thought would get me to that aim. So pilot was up there. Oh, um, I also wanted to be a pilot. Uh -huh, yeah. I then realised that I'm actually not that fond of taking off or landing, so <laughs> pilot would not be a good choice for me. Oh. Diplomat's a much better position. Yeah, and uh, indeed, I'm sure you've seen the world. How many countries? Um, so I've only worked in Nigeria, Brussels and Ghana for the okay. Foreign Office. I've also worked in Sierra Leone, but not as a civil servant. That was for an NGO on secondment. But yeah, I've been lucky enough to visit a lot of different countries. Chinese was part of my degree, so I was lucky enough to spend some time in China and see parts of Asia while I was there. Okay, so you're the first female uh, High Commissioner to Ghana. What does it feel like to be the first one? And uh, how are you going to use that role to inspire others? I mean, it's a great privilege to do this job, to be the person who's been chosen to represent the UK in a country that's as important to us as Ghana is, is a huge privilege. Uh, and it feels extra special to be the first woman in this role. I'm not alone. There are a lot of senior women diplomats in Accra. Okay. I'm glad that the UK has now joined that group. But yeah, I really want to make the most of it while I'm here. So not only um, having conversations with my own colleagues, uh, both here in Accra and across the, the FCDO network worldwide, but also seeing what I can do to persuade young women in Ghana that they can do whatever they want to do. There really needs to be no limit. Okay. And uh, you, what is your ambition for Ghana during your, your tenure? Because uh, Ian, he introduced the Ghana Grand as a way to engage with so many people and uh, at different levels. Are you also thinking about a campaign to engage Ghana? So not a bike ride. <laughs> I enjoy cycling, but I'm not as um, professional as Ian is in that regard. But certainly I want to get out across the country. And um, one of the great opportunities in this role is being able to meet a wide variety of people. So I really want to get under the skin of the country, find out what makes people tick and what are the things that really matter to Ghanaians. Um, it's often easier in the position that I'm in to engage with the big businesses rather than the smaller businesses, the well-known people, rather than the everyday people and I want to find a way to crack through that and get to know what what life is like for everybody in the country so I will be out and about a lot I will be looking for different ways to talk to all sorts of different people hope to use food as a way into that okay. the arts uh, fashion yeah looking forward to getting to know the country. Have you seen any places yet? So far, no, Around the country. sadly. Um, I visited a few years ago while I was based in Nigeria okay. with family and we visited Cape Coast Castle, um, but that's as far as I've got. So now that I've presented credentials, I'm very much looking forward to getting out and about. Let's talk about football a bit. I mean, the, the English are passionate about their football. Do you have a, a favourite? Uh, Liverpool is our family Liverpool. team. Yeah, okay. not a popular one in Ghana, I don't think. Liverpool? You seem to be more Tottenham Hotspur. No, 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 no. Liverpool is also quite popular. Oh, good. Oh, yeah. Good, good, good. I mean, the, the Aston Villa, players. I know, is popular too. Yeah, and Chelsea is also popular. Uh -huh, uh -huh, uh -huh. The blue. That's you, is it? Aha! <laughs> uh -huh, I should have worn some red. <laughs> <laughs> but that's okay. So the UK and Ghana's partnership keeps evolving. With every High Commissioner, Ian Walker, he was focused on business, trade and uh, economic opportunities, al al aligning both countries' ambition for a greater partnership. What will be your focus for the next phase of this relationship? So I wouldn't expect any major change. There'll be a lot of continuity. I think people in my position make a mistake if they think that it's all about them. It's not. I'm here in order to deliver on a long-term strategy for the Ghana-UK uh, partnership. 
So economics, trade, our investment relationship, they will continue to be really high priorities. Those are the things that will create jobs, that will bring prosperity to Ghana, and that's good for Ghana, it's good for the UK as well. So there'll be a lot more around that. I really want to champion Ghana's role in the region. I know that security is a priority for this government, and it's a priority for us as well. So I'm pleased that we've started a security dialogue with Ghana. We've had a major general from the UK in yes. town this week for army staff talks. So there are lots of things that I think we can do in that space to bolster Ghana's role as a leader in the region. All right, so you're talking about the, the recent trip by the UK's Minister for Africa um, to strengthen the UK-Ghana security and trade partnership. The £250,000 additional funding has been provided to support Ghana security. Can you explain how it's going to trickle down to uh, the rest of the population. Yeah, so we'll be using that money in different ways. A lot of it is looking at how we can support Ghana to be ready should there be some sort of crisis, a terrorist crisis, for example. So we're looking at the training that goes around that, helping the various parts of government that need to be part of the response to work together. Uh, we'll be looking at um, supporting for a live exercise later in the year. Okay. So there are lots of things around that. Also the use, the analysis of intelligence. But it goes beyond that as well looking at some of the work that we're doing in the human development space, recognising that really to tackle security instability, uh, it's the human development, those long-term drivers that we need to address. People need jobs, they need uh, services, able to access quality services where they live. So what I want to do is bring all of that together. Okay. Now one thing on the minds of many Ghanaians has to do with corruption and um the fight against corruption. There are those who don't believe that government or the state is doing enough mm -hmm. to fight corruption and that people, corrupt politicians and all sorts of people get away with uh, the loot because the state is not clamping down on them. Is there a way that the UK government can support the fight against corruption so that Ghanaians can see those who have not been convinced about the fight against corruption can see something being done. Yeah, so it's a really important point. Um, met means of tackling corruption is a bit of a golden thread running through a lot of our activity here in Ghana. Um, areas that I would draw out would be the government's digitisation agenda here in reducing the human to human contact and moving more government services online. Um, they're reducing the opportunities for corruption at low levels in the system. At the higher levels, it's so important for people to see that nobody is immune to prosecution. If people steal money, they will be prosecuted for stealing money. So the work that we're doing around illicit financial flows and to counter money laundering is really important in that regard. The UK does not want to be a destination for corrupt money. Uh, and so it's important for people in Ghana, people across the world, to know that if they try to hide their ill-gotten gains in the UK, the UK's crime agencies will be looking for them. So essentially the systems are there to detect people who would want to launder such monies, illicit monies, and the system would deal with them. Yeah, that's right, absolutely. Right. Do you intend to call out people who engage, you know, are maybe seen to be engaged in corruption, you know, political leaders and, and, and others during your tenure? Yeah, where the evidence is clear, then people need to know what's happening. I would put a note of caution on, these cases are notoriously difficult to prosecute. Building up the evidence is really hard, especially when it involves complex chains of money. One of the things that we're doing is helping the authorities in Ghana to build up that expertise so that they're able to follow the money and work out uh, who's implicated in a case and be able to build a compelling case against those people. Yeah. You indicated that, yes, uh, when it comes to trying uh, corrupt corruption cases, it's very difficult. But that's another problem that a lot of Ghanaians have. They don't think that the justice system is dealing as fairly with them as they should. The people who strongly believe that they have a case mm. and they get to, into the justice system, it's either they're delayed or they, they get you know, cases you know, ruled against them when they think that they really had a strong, strong case. Is there a way that the UK government again can support the justice system and uh, to ensure that there's, there's fairness? And maybe just to add to that, 
it's typically said in Ghana that you would have someone, uh, someone go steal maybe some bunch of, a bunch of plantain or some farm produce mm. just because they're hungry mm. and they're caught and they're handed down, you know, some really stringent sentences. And yet we have politicians who have been found to have been corrupt and the system says, refund the monies. And they don't think, people don't think that this is fair. You, this certainly can't be fair. So the issue that you've just raised it brings up a good example of a way that UK has worked with Ghana's judicial system. Um, we've worked with them to help develop sentencing guidelines so that there is less scope for that discrepancy between the crime and the guideline. It takes the, the subjectivity out of it and there's a, a set of criteria that have to be followed while sentences are being handed down. But I think that um, um, it's, it's really important that the judicial system is able to act independently, objectively and without political or any other influence. And on top of that, it's important that people see that to be the case as well. Indeed. And uh, there's also the case of uh, people who uh, report cases to the police, crimes to the police, and we're not getting resolution. It usually takes uh, like forever for there to be resolutions to these crimes. Are there systems or are there programs that are UK-funded programs that are supporting the police to become you know, as sharp as uh, the Scotland Yard, for instance. It's one of the things that we're looking at through our security dialogue. So we've agreed that there should be closer cooperation in these areas. Um, and we're working with the various agencies in Ghana to come up with a shared work programme. So the first set of meetings towards that have happened already. We hope to have an agreed plan by the end of the year so that we're really clear on how we can help to address the issues that really matter here. What do you make of the recent coup in, in Guinea and the suspension of the country by ECOWAS? Yeah. So the UK government has joined ECOWAS and the African Union in condemning the, the coup. It's clear that it's unconstitutional um, and we call for the president to be released and the constitution to be reinstituted as soon as possible. But yes, uh, the, those who say, well, the uh, ECOWAS and the other regional bodies they saw or they looked on as the president Tafa Konde overthrew the constitution which was illegal and got himself a third term mm -hmm. and yet when there was another Ill illegality they're condemning that illegality why didn't they condemn the first one You'd have to ask the ECOWAS members. Uh, what I can say though, as I think under President Akufuado's leadership now, their strong condemnation and their suspension of Guinea is, in, in the UK's opinion, absolutely the right course of action and we, we're fully supportive and in, in complete agreement with them on that. Okay, so yes, I, I may want to ask uh, you know, ECOWAS about that, but I would want to ask uh, the UK, because you, you also observed that yeah. the Alpha Conde overthrew the constitution. Yeah. So, I mean, I think um, it's very important. Constitutions are there for a reason. Uh, the people need to see that their constitutions are being respected and the politicians need to know that the, the procedures, the rules that are set out in the constitution are there for them as much as they're there for everybody else. Especially when there seems to be some, quite, uh, some support for the coup in, in Guinea because we're seeing you know, videos, viral videos of the junta leaders driving through the streets and being cheered on. Mm. And so if you have uh, an ECOWAS or a UK coming to condemn the coup when the people themselves feel this is probably what we wanted, yeah. Uh, you, you seem to be speaking at variance to what the people are. Asking. So my interpretation of that is that the people are showing their dissatisfaction uh, at the way that their democracy has been respected or not by their leaders. Um, I think it is a sign of the importance that people in this region attach to democracy. I think that it's important for us to work together towards strengthening democracy, the rule of law, respect for what the people of a country want. Uh, in thinking about how that country is governed. Let's talk about press freedom, which is uh, my area, I'm a journalist, and there seems to be what people call a culture of silence, where people who seek to speak out or speak up about issues that offend the powers that be get, you know, they go after them. Mm. 
And we've had instances where a journalist has been called out and threatened and next thing we know the person is dead. And the, those who feel that if these things happen and we don't get resolution to them, then it seems to be you know, state support of impunity against the and against journalists. Is there is that something that you have observed yourself? So media freedom has been and continues to be a priority for our government and I'm really glad that we were able to bring a number of journalists over to the UK for a media freedom conference. Um, the culture around media freedom in Ghana is something that I still need to get under the skin of. But absolutely, it's important that when crimes are committed against journalists, when journalists feel like they aren't able to speak up, we've got to address those things because they're at the heart of a well-functioning, healthy democracy. If people aren't able to speak up about the things that matter to them, um, then the democracy is in trouble. And Ghana is well known around the world for being an inclusive, tolerant society where people are able to speak up. So yes, I'm looking forward to talking to you and others in your profession to find out more and to see what we can do. All right, and uh, let's talk some trade. The UK is the first uh, country to sign an MOU with AFTA. Where, what got you to do that and why are, we taking, why are you taking this relationship? So we see the continental free trade area as a potential game changer for economies right the way across the continent of Africa. And frankly speaking, we see benefit in the UK for that as well. Um, at the moment, trade between African countries is much lower than you would expect uh, when you look at trade between countries on the same other continent elsewhere in the world. So there's huge potential for that to grow and for that to benefit the smallest companies right the way to the biggest companies. We want to help in the realisation of that potential and that's why we're really pleased to have signed this memorandum of understanding with the Secretariat. Okay. Now one of the things that the UK High Commission has been famous for has to do with the Chevening Scholarship where you get you offer scholarships to Ghanaians to go study in the in the UK. How are you do you intend to expand it? Do you intend to take it forward so that a lot more Ghanaians can, can benefit? Because there are lots of people who would love to take advantage of that. We certainly intend to take it forward and yes there are lots of Ghanaians who want to benefit from that. It's always heartwarming to see how many applications we get for this scheme. Uh, each year we're able to offer about 20 scholarships to Ghanaians um, which is a, it's a real benefit to Ghana. These are the cream of the crop. It's a really competitive process that people go through to secure these scholarships and the expectation is that after people have benefited from a year's worth of world-class education in the UK, they then come back and bring that learning to Ghana for the benefit of the country. Uh, it's always one of the highlights for me to meet these people. You can see I'm smiling as I talk about it. They're so clear on what they want to do, why they want to pursue this study and what they want to do with it when they come back to Ghana. It's always a really energising experience meeting with them and talking with them. Finally, let's end on a musical note. We've talked about food, we haven't talked about music. Have you sampled some of the songs that we have in, in Ghana? I'm so really enjoying Ghanaian music, okay. yeah. Uh, my kids and my husband and I can be caught dancing around the kitchen as we're getting food ready. It's impossible to keep your feet still, yeah. Okay, and you're able to, you know, move quite well no. to the beat? No, 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 this is why it's in my kitchen and not in public. <laughs> But any popular songs that uh, you've picked up so far? So one of my highlights, um, I don't know if you've seen on Twitter, we had a well-being day for our excellent High Commission team yesterday and the comms team put together a super video with a, a music by Sarkozy, so that's a, that's a current favourite at the moment. Okay, so we're going to look for that. So it's supposed to be on social media handles, yeah. right? Yeah. We're going to look for that to, to play. But thank you very much, uh, Your Excellency, for making time to speak with us. And once again, I want to warmly welcome you Thank to Ghana you. and I hope you enjoy your stay. Thank you very much. Nice to meet you.